everybody. Happy Friday. I hope that I'm coming in loud and clear. How's everyone doing? Oh, that's me. How's everyone doing? Oh, that's naughty. See? Hi, Sal girl. Can you hear me? Do you have your snacks? I'm a big shadow. So this is part three. And I hope that, oh, Caitlin, you're not feeling good. I hope you're feeling better. Maybe don't associate my voice with being sick then. <laughs> I'm kidding. I hope you're feeling better soon. I think something's going around. Libra, hello. I'm fuzzy. Shoot. Okay, I will. I'll come. I wish I could like, but I feel like, okay, I'll try it again and see if it's not fuzzy. My voice or the screen is fuzzy. Okay, I'll go out and come back. How does it sound now, Zav? I hope we don't have fuzzy issues because that's going to be so bad. It's Friday night, you guys. I don't know what kind of snacks y'all have. But, or drinks. So I'm just doing fruit punch. Let's see if the mic's any better. Is it okay? If it's not, do you know what it is? It's the Wi-Fi, unfortunately. So hopefully it got a little better. Um, so I'm going to be reading, as you all know, part three. And if you haven't caught up and you're here, it's okay, you can catch up later and hang out and listen and listen again. We're on chapter 15. You have cherry Kool-Aid and pineapple upside down cake that your daughter made, Libra. I am jealous. I kind of, I want something like cake or cookie-ish. And the only thing close to that we have is chocolate Belgian waffles. And I mean, I'm just not in the I'm not in the mood for Belgian waffles, but maybe eat some for me and have some cherry Kool-Aid for me. Let me know if the mic is bad. Let me get closer to it too, because I feel like it's so far away from me. All right. Are we ready to find out what Tyler Durden has been up to? See how naughty he's been. Okay. It does have, it's back and forth. Yeah, that might end up being a problem because, hi Batman, hi Steph. It might be a problem because that's gonna be the Wi-Fi if um, it's staticky, so. Oh, you have strawberry Italian ice. You guys, Steph and Batman, right now we're talking about what snacks we have before I start reading. Because once I start reading, I can't even see you guys in chat anymore. Um, 
Hi, Megan Randall. Thanks for joining us. So excited to have you all here. So I'm going to give this a go. And if it's really bad, I'll, we'll do it again tomorrow or something. And I'll upload part three tomorrow. Batman brought popcorn. I knew he would bring popcorn. That's the best thing. I'm going to be eating um, vic vicariously through you too also. Batman, I guess I have a lot of uh, yummy snacks in the virtual world. <laughs> okay, ready guys? So chapter 15. Mr. His Honor, Mr. Chapter President of the local chapter of the National United Projectionist and Independent Theater Operators Union, just sat. Under and behind and inside everything the man took for granted, something horrible had been growing. Nothing is static. Everything is falling apart. I know this because Tyler knows this. For three years, Tyler had been doing film buildup and breakdown for a chain of movie houses. A movie travels in one or seven small reels. You know what, you guys? Like, I don't even know if I can hear myself. Hold on. Let me start over. I feel like something's off with the mic. Can you guys hear me? I don't know why. I usually, I don't need to wear headphones, but I wear headphones when I do this. So I could pick up because it'll pick up like every little noise that could possibly be picked up when you wear headphones. So, um, but I'm like not hearing myself well. So it's interesting. So hopefully you guys hear me. Um, Thank you, Libra. Okay, awesome. Let's continue. I will read that again. Um, okay. A movie travels in six or seven small reels packed in a metal case. Tyler's job was to splice the small reels together into single five-foot reels that self-threaded and rewinding projectors could handle. After three years, seven theaters and at least three screens per theater, new shows every week, Tyler had handled hundreds of prints. Too bad, but with more self-threading and rewinding projectors, the union didn't need Tyler anymore. Mr. Chapter President had to call Tyler in for a little sit down. The work was boring and the pay was crap. So the president of the United Union of United Projection Operators, Independent, and United Theaters United said it was doing Tyler Durden a chapter favor by giving Tyler the diplomatic shaft. Don't think of this as a rejection. Think of it as downsizing. Right up the butt, Mr. Chapter President himself says, we appreciate your contribution to our success. Oh, that wasn't a problem, Tyler said, and grinned. As long as the union kept sending a paycheck, he'd keep his mouth shut. Tyler said, think of this as an early retirement with pension. Tyler had handled hundreds of prints. Movies had gone back to the distributor. Movies had gone back out in re-release. Comedy, drama, musicals, romance, action, adventure. Spliced with Tyler's single frame flashes of pornography. Sodomy, fellatio, 
cunnilingus bondage. Tyler had nothing to lose. Tyler was the pawn of the world, everybody's trash. This is what Tyler rehearsed me to tell the manager of the Pressman Hotel to. At Tyler's other job at the Pressman Hotel, Tyler said he was nobody. Nobody cared if he lived or died, and the feeling was fucking mutual. This is what Tyler told me to say in the hotel manager's office with security guards sitting outside the door. Tyler and I stayed up late and traded stories after everything was over. Right after he'd gone to the projectionist union, Tyler had told had me go and confront the manager of the Pressman Hotel. Tyler and I were looking more and more like identical twins. Both of us had punched out cheekbones and our skin had lost its memory and forgot where to slide back to after we were hit. My bruises were from Fight Club and Tyler's face was punched out by, punched out of shape by the president of the projectionist union. After Tyler crawled out of the union offices, I went to see the manager of the Pressman Hotel. I sat there in the office of the manager of the Pressman Hotel. I'm Joe's smirking revenge. The first thing the hotel manager said was I had three minutes. In the first 30 seconds, I told how I'd been peeing into soup, farting on creme brulees, sneezing on braised endive, and now I wanted the hotel to send me a check every week equivalent to my average week's pay plus tips. In return, I wouldn't come to work anymore. And I wouldn't go to the newspapers or the public health people with the confused, tearful confession. The headlines. Troubled waiter at Mint's tainting food. Sure, I said. I might go to prison. They could hang me and yank my nuts off and drag me through the streets and flay my skin and burn me with lye. But the Pressman Hotel would always be known as a hotel where the richest people in the world ate pee. Tyler's words coming out of my mouth. And I used to be such a nice person. At the projectionist union office, Tyler had laughed after the union president punched him. One punch knocked Tyler out of his chair and Tyler sat against the wall laughing. <laughs> Go ahead, you can't kill me. Tyler was laughing. You stupid fuck. Beat the crap out of me, but you can't kill me. You have, you have too much to lose. I have nothing. You have everything. Go ahead, right in the gut. Take another shot at my face. Cave in my teeth but keep those paychecks coming. Crack my ribs, but if you miss one week's pay, I go public and you and your little union go down under lawsuits from every theater owner and film distributor and mommy whose kid may have seen a hard on in Bambi. I am trash, Tyler said. I am trash and shit and crazy to you and this whole fucking world. Tyler said to the union president, you don't care where I live or how I feel or what I eat or how I feed my kids or how I pay the doctor if I get sick. And yes, I am stupid and bored and weak, but I'm still your responsibility. Sitting in the office at the Pressman Hotel, my Fight Club lips were still split into about 10 segments. The butthole in my cheek looking at the manager of the Pressman Hotel. It was all pretty convincing. Basically, I said the same stuff Tyler said. After the union president had, had slugged Tyler to the floor, after Mr. President saw Tyler wasn't fighting back, his honor with his big Cadillac bodybuilder 
bigger and stronger than he would have ever really needed, his honor hauled his wingtip back and kicked Tyler in the ribs, and Tyler laughed. His honor shot the wingtip into Tyler's kidneys after Tyler curled into a ball, but Tyler was still laughing. Get it out, Tyler said. Trust me. You'll feel a lot better. You'll feel great. In the office of the Pressman Hotel, I asked the hotel manager if I could use his phone, and I dialed the number of the city desk at the newspaper. With the hotel manager watching, I said, Hello, I said. I've committed a terrible crime against humanity as part of a political protest. My protest is over the exploitation of workers in this service industry. If I went to prison, I wouldn't be just an unbalanced pion diddling in the soup. This would have heroic scale. Robin Hood waiter champions have nots. This would be about a lot more than one hotel and one waiter. The manager of the Pressman Hotel very gently took the receiver out of my hand. The manager said he didn't want me working here anymore. Not the way I look now. I'm standing at the head of the manager's desk when I say, What? You don't like the idea of this? And without flinching, still looking at the manager, I roundhouse the fist at the centrifugal force at at the centrifugal force end of my arm and slam fresh blood out of the cracked scabs in my nose. For no reason at all, I remember the night Tyler and I had our first fight. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. This isn't such a hard punch. I punch myself again and it just looks good all the blood, but I throw myself back against the wall to make a terrible noise and I break the painting that hangs there. The broken glass and frame and the painting of flowers and blood go to the floor with me, clowning around. I'm being such a doofus. Blood gets on the carpet and I reach up and grip monster handprints of blood on the edge of the hotel manager's desk and say, please, Help me, but I start to giggle. Please help, please. Please don't hit me again. I slip back to the floor and crawl my blood across the carpet. The first word I'm going to say is please. So I keep my lips shut. The monster drags itself across the lovely bouquets and garlands in the oriental carpet. The blood falls out of my nose and slides down the back of my throat and into my mouth, hot. The monster crawls across the carpet, hot and picking up the lint and dust sticking to the blood on its claws. And it crawls close enough to grab the manager of the Pressman Hotel around his pinstriped ankle and say it. Please say it. Please comes out in a bubble of blood. Say it, please. And the bubble pops blood all over. And this is how Tyler was free to start a fight club every night of the week. After this, there were seven fight clubs. And after that, there were 15 fight clubs. And after that, there were 23 fight clubs and Tyler wanted more. There was always money coming in. Please, I asked the manager of the Pressman Hotel, give me the money. And I giggle again, please. And please don't hit me again. You have so much and I have nothing. And I start to climb my blood up the pinstriped legs of the manager of the Pressman Hotel, who is leaning back hard with his hands on the windowsill behind him and even his thin lips retreating from his teeth. The monster hooks its bloody claw into the waistband of the manager's pants and pulls itself up to clutch the white starched shirt and I wrap my bloody hands around the manager's smooth wrists. 
please. I smile big enough to split my lips. There's a struggle as the manager screams and tries to get his hands away from me and my blood and my crushed nose filth sticking to the blood on both of us. And right then, at our most excellent moment, the security guards decide to walk in. Chapter 16. It's in the newspaper today how somebody broke into the offices between the 10th and 15th floors of the Hind Tower and climbed out of the office windows and painted the south side of the building with a grinning five-story mask and set fires to the window at the center of each huge eye blazing, huge and alive and inescapable over the city at dawn. In the picture on the front page of the newspaper, the face is an angry pumpkin, Japanese demon, dragon, hanging in the sky, and the smoke is a witch's eyebrows or devil's horns, and people cried with their heads thrown back. What did it mean? And who would do this? And even after the fires were out, the face was still there. And it was worse. The empty eyes seemed to watch everyone in the street, but at the same time were dead. The stuff in the newspaper, this is the stuff you see in the newspaper more and more. Of course you read this and you want to know right away if it was part of Project Mayhem. The newspaper says the police have no real leads. Youth gangs or space aliens. Whoever it could have whoever it was could have died while crawling down ledges and dangling from windowsills with cans of black spray paint. Was it the mischief committee or the arson committee? The giant face was probably their homework assignment from last week. Tyler would know, but the first rule about Project Mayhem is you don't ask questions about Project Mayhem. In the assault committee of Project Mayhem, this week, Tyler says, he ran everyone through what it would take to shoot a gun. All a gun does is focus an explosion in one direction. At the last meeting of the assault committee, Tyler brought a gun and the yellow pages of a phone book. They meet in the basement where Fight Club meets on Saturday night. Each committee meets on a different night. Arson meets on Monday, Assault on Tuesday, Mischief meets on Wednesday, and Misinformation meets on Thursday. Organized chaos, the bureaucracy of anarchy, you figure it out. Support groups, sort of. So Tuesday night, the assault committee proposed events for the upcoming week, and Tyler read the proposals and gave the committee its homework. By this time next week, each guy on the assault committee has to pick a fight where he won't come out a hero and not in fight club. This is harder than it sounds. A man on the street will do anything not to fight. The idea is to take some Joe on the street who's never been in a fight and recruit him. Let him experience winning for the first time in his life. Get him to explode. Give him permission to beat the crap out of you. You can take it. If you win, you screwed up. What we have to do, people, Tyler told the committee, is remind these guys what kind of power they still have. This is Tyler's little pep talk. Then he opened each of the folded squares of paper in the cardboard box in front of him. This is how each committee proposes events for the upcoming week. Write the event on the committee tablet, tear off the sheet, fold it, and put it in the box. Tyler checks out the proposals and throws out any bad ideas. For each idea he throws out, Tyler puts a folded blank into the box. Then everyone in the committee takes the paper out of the box 
the way Tyler explained the process to me, if somebody draws a blank, he only has his homework to do that week. If you draw a proposal, then you have to go out to the important beer festival this weekend and push over a guy in a chemical toilet. You'll get extra fit. You'll get extra favor if you get beat up for doing this. Or you have to attend the fashion show at the shopping center atrium and throw strawberry gelatin from the mezzanine. If you get arrested, you're off the assault committee. If you laugh, you're off the committee. Nobody knows who draws a proposal and nobody except Tyler knows what all the proposals are and which are accepted and which proposal he throws in the trash. Later that week, you might read in the newspaper about an unidentified man downtown jumping the driver of a Jaguar convertible and steering the car into a fountain. You have to wonder, was this a committee proposal you could have drawn? The next Tuesday night, You'll be looking at the assault committee meeting under the one light in the back in the black fight club basement. And you're still wondering who forced the jag into the fountain. Who went to the roof of the art museum and snipered paintballs into the sculpture court reception? Who painted the blazing demon mask on the hind tower? The night of the Hind Tower assignment, you can picture a team of law clerks and bookkeepers or mes messengers sneaking into offices where they sat every day. Maybe they were a little drunk, even if it's against the rules in Project Mayhem. And they used passkey where they could and used spray canisters of Freon to shatter lock cylinders so they could dangle, repelling against the tower's brick facade, dropping, trusting each other to hold ropes, swinging, risking quick death in offices where every day they felt their lives end one hour at a time. The next morning, these same clerks and assistant account reps would be in the crowd with their neatly combed heads thrown back, rummy without sleep, but sober and wearing ties and listening to the crowd around them wonder, who would do this? And the police shout for everyone to please get back now. As water ran down from the broken, smoky center of each huge eye. Tyler told me in secret that there's never more than four good proposals in a meeting. So your chances of drawing a real proposal and not just a blank are about four in 10. There are 25 guys on the assault committee, including Tyler. Everybody gets their homework, lose a fight in public, and each member draws for a proposal. This week, Tyler told them, go out and buy a gun. Tyler gave one guy, I'm sorry, guys, I'm going to mute. It's going to be like a second um, while the dog eats because it'll probably disturb everybody. Sorry, everybody. Okay. This week, Tyler told them, go out and buy a gun. Tyler gave one guy the telephone book. 
yellow pages and told him to tear out an advertisement, then pass the book to the next guy. No two guys should go to the same place to buy or shoot. This, Tyler said, and he took a gun out of his coat pocket. This is a gun. And in two weeks, you should each of you have a gun about this size to bring to meeting. Better you should pay for it with cash, Tyler said. Next meeting, you'll all trade guns and report the gun you bought was stolen. Nobody asked anything. You don't ask questions in the first rule of Project Mayhem. Tyler handed the gun around. It was so heavy for something so small, as if a giant thing like a mountain or a sun were collapsed and melted down to make this. The committee guys held it by two fingers. Everyone wanted to ask if it was loaded, but the second rule of Project Mayhem is you don't ask questions. Maybe it was loaded, maybe not. Maybe we should always assume the worst. A gun, Tyler said, is simple and perfect. You just draw the trigger back. The third rule in Project Mayhem is no excuses. The trigger, Tyler said, frees the hammer and the hammer strikes the powder. The fourth rule is no lies. The explosion blasts the metal slug off at the open end of the shell and the barrel of the gun focuses the exploding powder and the rocketing slug, Tyler said. Like a man out of a canyon, like a missile out of a silo, like your jism in one direction. When Tyler invented Project Mayhem, Tyler said the goal of Project Mayhem had nothing to do with other people. Tyler didn't care if other people got hurt or not. The goal was to teach each man in the project that he had the power to control history. We, each of us, can take control of the world. It was at Fight Club that Tyler invented Project Mayhem. I tagged a first timer one night at Fight Club. That Saturday, a young guy with an angel's face came to his first fight club and I tagged him for a fight. That's the rule. If it's your first night in fight club, you have to fight. I knew that. So I tagged him because insomnia was on again and I was in a mood to destroy something beautiful. Since most of my face never gets a chance to heal, I've got nothing to lose in the looks department. My boss at work, he asked me what I was doing about the hole through my cheek that never heals. When I drink coffee, I told him, I put two fingers over the hole so it won't leak. There's a sleeper hold that gives somebody just enough air to stay awake. And that night at Fight Club, I hit our first timer and hammered that beautiful Mr. Angel face first with the bony knuckles of my fist like a pounding molar, and then the knotted tight butt of my fist after my knuckles were raw from his teeth stuck through his lips. Then the kid fell through my arms in a heap. Tyler told me later that he'd never seen me destroy something so completely. That night, Tyler knew he had to take Fight Club up a notch or shut it down. Tyler said, sitting at the breakfast the next morning, you look like a maniac, psycho boy. Where did you go? I said I felt like crap and had not released it and had not relaxed at all. I didn't get any kind of a buzz. Maybe I developed a Jones. You can build up a tolerance to fighting and maybe I needed to move on to something bigger. It was that morning Tyler invented Project Mayhem. Tyler asked what I was really fighting. What Tyler says about be, being the crap and the slaves of history, that's how I felt. 
I wanted to destroy everything beautiful I'd never have. Burn the Amazon rainforest, pump chlorofluorocarbons carbon straight up to gobble the ozone, open the dump valves on super tankers and uncap offshore oil wells. I wanted to kill all the fish I couldn't afford to eat and smother the French beaches I'd never see. I wanted the whole world to hit bottom. Pounding that kid, I really wanted to put a bullet between the eyes of every endangered panda that wouldn't screw to save its species and every whale or dolphin that gave up and ran itself aground. Don't think of this as extinction. Think of this as downsizing. For thousands of years, human beings had screwed up and trashed and crapped on this planet. And now history expected me to clean up after everyone. I have, well, I have to wash out and flatten my soup cans and account for every drop of used motor oil. And I have to foot the bill for nuclear waste and buried gasoline tanks and landfill toxic sludge dumped a generation before I was born. I held the face of Mr. Angel like a baby or a football in the crook of my arm and bashed him with my knuckles, bashed him until his teeth broke through his lips bashed him with my elbow after that until he fell through my arms into a heap at my feet until the skin was pounded thin across his cheekbones and turned black. I wanted to breathe smoke. Birds and deer are a silly luxury and all the fish should be floating. I wanted to burn the Louvre. I do the Elgin marbles with a sledgehammer and wipe my ass with the Mona Lisa. This is my world now. This is my world, my world. And those ancient people are dead. It was at breakfast that morning that Tyler invented Project Mayhem. We wanted to blast the world free of history. We were eating breakfast in the house on Paper Street. And Tyler said, Picture yourself planting radishes and seed potatoes on the 15 green of a forgotten golf course. You'll hunt elk through the damp canyon forest, run around the ruins of Rockefeller Center, and dig clams next to the skeleton of the Space Needle, leaning at a 45 degree angle. We'll paint the skyscrapers with huge totem faces and goblin tiki's. And every evening, what's left of mankind will retreat to empty zoos and lock itself in cages as projection as protection against bears and big cats and wolves that pace and watch us from outside the cage bars at night. Recycling and speed limits are bullshit, Tyler said. They're like someone who quits smoking on his deathbed. It's Project Mayhem that's going to save the world. The Cultural Ice Age, a prematurely induced dark age. Project Mayhem will force humanity to go dormant or into remission long enough for the earth to recover. You justify anarchy, Tyler says. You figure it out. Like Fight Club does with clerks and box boys, Project Mayhem will break up civilization so we can make something better out of the world. Imagine, Tyler said, stalking elk past department store windows and stinking racks of beautiful rotting dresses and tuxedos on hangers. You'll wear leather clothes that will last you the rest of your life, and you'll climb the wrist-thick kootsu vines that wrap the Sears Tower. Jack and the Beanstalk. You'll climb up through the dripping forest canopy, and the air will be so clean. You'll see tiny figures pounding corn and laying strips of venison to dry in the empty carpool lane of an abandoned superhighway, stretching eight lanes wide an August hop for a thousand miles. 
This was the goal of Project Mayhem, Tyler said, the complete and right away destruction of civilization. What comes next in Project Mayhem? Nobody except Tyler knows. The second rule is you don't ask questions. Don't get any bullets, Tyler's told the assault committee. And just don't worry about it. Yes, you're going to have to kill someone. Arson, assault, mischief, and misinformation. No questions, no questions, no excuses, and no lies. The fifth rule about Project Mayhem is you have to trust Tyler. Chapter 17. My boss brings another sheet of paper to my desk and sets it at my elbow. I don't even wear a tie anymore. My boss is wearing his blue tie, so it must be Thursday. The door to my boss's office is always closed now. And we haven't traded more than two words any day since he found the Fight Club rules in the copy machine. And I may be implied I might gut him with a shotgun blast. Just me clowning around again. Or I might call the compliance people at the Department of Transportation. There's a front seat mounting bracket that never passed collision testing before it went into production. If you know where to look, there are bodies buried everywhere. Morning, I say. He says, morning. Set at my elbow is another for my eyes only important secret document Tyler wanted me to type up and copy. A week ago, Tyler was pacing out the dimensions of the basement of the rented house on Paper Street. It's 65 shoe lanes front to back and 40 shoe lanes side to side. Tyler was thinking out loud. Tyler asked me, what is six times seven? 42. And 42 times three? 126. Tyler gave me a handwritten list of notes and said to type it and make 72 copies. Why that many? Because, Tyler said, that's how many guys can sleep in the basement if we put them in triple-decker army surplus bunk beds. I asked, what about their stuff? Tyler said, they won't bring anything more than what's on the list and it should all fit under a mattress. The list my boss finds in the copy machine, the copy machine counter still set to 72 copies, the list sets. Bringing the required items does not guarantee admission to training, but no applicant will be considered unless he arrives equipped with the following items and exactly $500 cash for personal burial money. It costs at least $300 to cremate an indigent indigenous corpse, Tyler told me, and the price was going up. Anyone who dies without at least this much money, their body goes to an autopsy class. This money must always be carried in the student's shoe, so if the student is ever killed, his death will not be a burden on Project Mayhem. In addition, the applicant has to arrive with the following. Two black shirts. Two black pairs of trousers. One pair of heavy black shoes two pair of black socks and two pair of plain underwear, one heavy black coat. This includes the clothes the applicant has on his back, one white towel, one army surplus cot mattress, one white plastic mixing bowl. At my desk with the boss still standing there, I pick up the original list and tell him thanks. My boss goes into his office and I set to working solitaire on my computer. After work, I give Tyler the copies and days go by. I go to work, I come home, I go to work. I come home and there's a guy standing on our front porch. 
the guys at the front door with his second black shirt and pants and a brown paper sack. And he's got the last three items, a white towel, an army surplus mattress, and a plastic bowl set on the porch railing. From an upstairs window, Tyler and I peek out at the guy, and Tyler tells me to send the guy away. He's too young, Tyler says. The guy on the porch is Mr. Angelface, whom I tried to destroy the night Tyler invented Project Mayhem. Even with his two black eyes and blonde crew cut, you can see his tough pre-scrowl without wrinkles or scars. Put him in a dress and make him smile and he'd be a woman. Mr. Angel just stands his toes against the front door, just looks straight ahead into the splintering wood with his hands at his sides wearing black shoes, black shirt, black pair of trousers. Get rid of him, Tyler tells me. He's too young. I ask, how young is too young? It doesn't matter, Tyler says. If the applicant is young, we tell him he's too young. If he's fat, he's too fat. If he's old, he's too old. Thin, he's too thin. White, he's too white. Black, he's too black. This is how Buddhist temples have tested applicants going back for a bazillion years, Tyler says. You tell the applicant to go away, and if his result is so strong that he waits at the entrance without food or shelter or encouragement for three days, then, and only then, can he enter and begin the training. So I tell Mr. Angelface he's too young, but at lunchtime, he's still there. After lunch, I go out and beat Mr. Angel with a broom and kick the guy's sack out into the street. From upstairs, Tyler watches me stick, stick ball the broom upside the kid's ear and the kid standing there. Then I kick his stuff into the gutter and scream, go away, I'm screaming. Haven't you heard? You're too young. You'll never make it, I scream. Come back in a couple of years and apply again. Just go. Just get off my porch. The next day, the guy is still there, and Tyler goes out to him. I'm sorry. Tyler says he's sorry he told the guy about training, but the guy is really too young. And would he please just go? Good cop, bad cop. I scream at the poor guy again. Then, six hours later, Tyler goes out and says he's sorry, but no. The guy has to leave. Tyler says he's going to call the police if the guy won't leave. And the guy stays. And his clothes are still in the gutter. The wind takes the torn paper sock away. And the guy stays. On the third day, another applicant is at the front door. Mr. Angel is still there. And Tyler goes down and just tells Mr. Angel, come in. Get your stuff off the street and come in. To the new guy, Tyler says, he's sorry, but there's been a mistake. The new guy is too old to train here. And would he please leave? I go to work every day. I come home and every day there's one or two guys waiting on the front porch. These new guys don't make eye contact. I shut the door and leave them on the porch. This happens every day for a while, and sometimes the applicants will leave. But most of the times, the applicants stick it out until the third day, until most of the 72 bunk beds Tyler and I bought and set up in the basement are full. One day, Tyler gives me $500 in cash and tells me to keep it in my shoe all the time. My personal burial money. This is another old Buddhist monastery thing. I come home from work now and the house is filled with strangers that Tyler has accepted. All of them working. The whole first floor turns into a kitchen and a soap factory. 
The bathroom is never empty. Teams of men disappear for a few days and come home with red rubber bags of thin, watery fat. One night, Tyler comes upstairs to find me hiding in my room and says, don't bother them. They all know what to do. It's part of Project Mayhem. No one guy understands the whole plan, but each guy is trained to do one simple task perfectly. The rule in Project Mayhem is you have to trust Tyler. Then Tyler's gone. Teams of Project Mayhem guys render fat all day. I'm not sleeping. All night I hear other teams mix the lye and cut the bars and bake the bars of soap on cookie sheets, then wrap each bar in tissue and seal it with the Paper Street Soap Company label. Everyone except me seems to know what to do, and Tyler is never home. I hug the walls, being a mouse trapped in this clockwork of silent men with the energy of trained monkeys cooking and working and sleeping in teams pull a lever, punch a button. A team of space monkeys cooks meals all day and all day teams of space monkeys are eating out of the plastic bowls they brought with them. One morning, I'm leaving for work and Big Bob's on the front porch wearing black shoes and a black shirt and pants. I ask, has he seen Tyler lately? Did Tyler send him here? The first rule about Project Mayhem, Big Bob says with the heels together and his back ramrod straight, is you don't ask questions about Project Mayhem. So what brainless little honor has Tyler assigned him, I ask? There are guys whose job it is just to boil rice all day or wash out eating bowls or clean the crapper all day. Has Tyler promised Big Bob enlightenment if he spends 16 hours a day wrapping bars of soap? Big Bob doesn't say anything. I go to work, I come home, and Big Bob's still on the porch. I don't sleep all night, and the next morning, Big Bob's out tending the garden. Before I leave for work, I ask Big Bob who let him in. Who assigned him this task? Did he see Tyler? Was Tyler here last night? Big Bob says, the first rule of Project Mayhem is you don't talk. I cut him off. I say, yeah, 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 yeah. And while I'm at work, teams of space monkeys dig up the muddy lawn around the house and cut the dirt with Epsom salts to lower the acidity and spade in loads of free steer manure from the stockyards and bags of hair clippings from the barber shops to ward off moles and mice and boost the protein in the soil. At any time of the night, space monkeys from some slaughterhouse come home with bags of blood meal to boost the iron in the soil and bone meal to boost the phosphorus. Teams of space monkeys plant basil and thyme and lettuce and starts of witch hazel and eucalyptus and mock orange and mint in a kaleidoscope knot pattern. A rose window in every shade of green and other teams go out at night and kill the slugs and, and snails by candlelight. Another team of space monkeys picks only the most perfect leaves and juniper berries to boil for the natural dye. Calm free because it's a natural disinfectant. Violet leaves because they cure headaches and sweet woodruff because it gives soap a cut grass smell. In the kitchen are bottles of 80 proof vodka to make translucent rose geranium and brown sugar soap and the patchouli soap. And I steal a bottle of vodka and spend my personal burial money on cigarettes. Marla shows up. We talk about plants. Marla and I walk on raked gravel paths through the kaleidoscope green patterns of the garden, drinking and smoking. We talk about her breasts. We talk about everything except Tyler Durden. 
And one day it's in the newspaper how a team of men wearing black had stormed through a better neighborhood in a luxury car dealership, slamming baseball bats against the front bumpers of cars so the airbags inside would explode in a powdery mess with their car alarms screaming. At the Paper Street Soap Company, other teams picked the petals from roses and lavender and pack the flowers into boxes with a cake of pure tallow that will absorb their scent from making soap with flower smell. Marla tells me about the plants. The rose, Marla tells me, is a natural astringent. Some of the plants have obituary names, iris, basil, rue, rosemary, and verbena. Some, like meadow sweet or cowslip, sweet flag, and spikenard, are like the names of Shakespeare's fairies. Deer tongue with its sweet vanilla smell, witch hazel, another natural astringent, orris root, the wild Spanish iris, Every night, Marla and I walk in the garden until I'm sure that Tyler's not coming home that night. Right behind us is always a space monkey trailing us to pick up the twist of balm or rue or mint Marla crushes under my nose. A dropped cigarette butt. The space monkey, monkey rakes the path behind him to erase our ever being there. And one night, in an uptown square park, another group of men poured gasoline around every tree and from tree to tree and set a perfect little forest fire. It was in the newspaper how townhouses, windows across the street from the fire melted and parked cars farted and settled on melted flat tires. Tyler's rented house on Paper Street is a living thing, wet on the inside from so many people sweating and breathing. So many people are moving inside. The house moves. Another night that Tyler didn't come home, someone was drilling bank machines and pay phones and then screwing the loop fittings into the drilled holes and using a grease gun to pump the bank machines and to pay telephones full of axle grease or vanilla pudding. And Tyler was never at home. But after a month, a few of the space monkeys had Tyler's kiss burned under the back of their hand. Then those space monkeys were gone too and new ones were on the front porch to replace them. And every day, the teams of men came and went in different cars. You never saw the same car twice. One evening, I heard Marla on the front porch telling a space monkey, I'm here to see Tyler. Tyler Durden. He lives here. I'm his friend. The space monkey says, I'm sorry, but you're too... And he pauses. You're too young to train here. Marla says, get screwed. Besides, the space monkey says, you haven't brought the required items. Two black shirts, two pair of black pants. Marla screams, Tyler! One pair of heavy black shoes. Tyler! Two pair of black socks and two pair of plain underwear. Tyler! And I hear the front door slam shut. Marla doesn't wait the three days. Most days after work, I come home and make a peanut butter sandwich. When I come home, one space monkey is reading to the assembled mon space monkeys who sit covering the whole first floor. You are not a beautiful and unique snowflake. You are the same decaying organic matter as everyone else. And we are all part of the same compost pile. The space monkey continues. Our culture has made us all the same. 
No one is truly white or black or rich anymore. We all want the same. Individually, we are nothing. The reader stops when I walk in to make my sandwich and all the space monkeys sit silent as if I were alone. I say, don't bother. I've already read it. I typed it. Even my boss has probably read it. We're all just a big bunch of crap, I say. Go ahead, play your little game. Don't mind me. The space monkeys wait in quiet while I make my sandwich and take another bottle of vodka and go upstairs. Behind me, I hear, you are not a beautiful and unique snowflake. I'm Joe's broken heart because Tyler's dumped me because my father dumped me. Oh, I could go on and on. Some nights after work, I go to a different fight club in the basement of a bar or a garage, and I ask if anybody's seen Tyler Durden. In every new fight club, someone I've never met is standing under the one light in the center of the darkness, surrounded by men and reading Tyler's words. The first rule about fight clubs, you don't talk about fight club. When the fights get started, I take the club leader aside and ask if he's seen Tyler. I live with Tyler, I say, and he hasn't been home for a while. And the guy's eyes get big and he asks, do I really know Tyler Durden? This happens in most of the new fight clubs. Yes, I say I'm best buddies with Tyler. Then everybody all of a sudden wants to shake my hand. These new guys stare at the butthole in my cheek and the black skin on my face, yellow and green around the edges, and they all call me sir. No, sir. Not hardly, sir. Nobody they've ever known met Tyler Durden. Friends of friends met Tyler Durden, and they found this chapter of Fight Club, sir. Then they wink at me. Nobody they know has ever seen Tyler Durden, sir. Is it true, everybody asks? Is Tyler Durden building an army? That's the word. Does Tyler Durden only sleep one hour a night? Rumor has it that Tyler's on the road starting fight clubs all over the country. What's next? Everybody wants to know. The meetings for Project Mayhem have moved to bigger basements because each committee, arson, assault, mischief, and misinformation gets bigger as more guys graduate out of Fight Club. Each committee has a leader and even the leaders don't know where Tyler's at. Tyler calls them every week on the phone. Everybody on Project Mayhem wants to know what's next. Where are we going? What is there to look forward to? On Paper Street, Marla and I walk through the garden at night with our bare feet, every step brushing up the smell of sage and lemon, ver and lemon verbena and rose geranium. Black shirts and black pants hunch around us with candles, lifting plant leaves to kill a snail or a slug. Marla asks, what's going on here? Tufts of hair surface beside the dirt clods. Hair and shit. Bone meal and blood meal. The plants are growing faster and the space monkeys can, are growing faster than the space monkeys can cut them back. Marla asks, what are you going to do? What's the word? In the dirt is a shining spot of gold and I kneel down to see. What's going to happen next? I don't know, I tell Marla. It looks like we've both been dumped. In the corner of my eye, the space monkeys pace around in black, each one hunched over his candle. The little spot of gold in the dirt is a molar. 
with a gold filling. Next to it surface two more molars with silver algonin fillings. It's a jawbone. I say, no, I can't say what's going to happen. And I push the one, two, three molars into the dirt and hair and shit and bone and blood where Marla won't see. Chapter 18. This Friday night, I fall asleep at my desk at work. When I wake up with my face and my crossed arms on my desktop, the telephone is ringing and everyone else is gone. A telephone was ringing in my dream and it's not clear if reality slipped into my dream or if my dream is sloping over into reality. I answer the phone. Compliance and liability. That's my department, compliance and liability. The sun is going down and piled up storm clouds the size of Wyoming and Japan are headed our way. It's not like I have a window at work. All the outside walls are floor to ceiling glass. Everything where I work is floor to ceiling glass. Everything is vertical blinds. Everything is industrial, low pile gray carpet spotted with little tombstone monuments where the PCs plug into the network. Everything is a maze of cubicles boxed in with fences of upholstered plywood. A vacuum cleaner hums somewhere. My boss has gone on vacation he sent me an email and then disappeared. I'm to prepare for a formal review in two weeks. Reserve a conference room. Get all my ducks in a row. Update my resume. That sort of thing. They're building a case against me. I'm Joe's complete lack of surprise. I've been behaving miserably. I pick up the phone and it's Tyler and he says, Go outside. There's some guys waiting for you in the parking lot. I ask, who are they? They're all waiting, Tyler says. I smell gasoline on my hands. Tyler says, hit the road. They have a car outside. They have a Cadillac. I'm still asleep. Here, I'm not sure if Tyler is in my dream or if I'm in Tyler's dream. I sniff the gasoline on my hands. There's nobody else around, and I get up and walk out to the parking lot. A guy in Fight Club works on cars, so he's parked at the curb in somebody's black cornache. And all I can do is look at it, all black and gold, this huge cigarette case ready to drive me somewhere. This mechanic guy who gets out of the car tells me not to worry. He switched the plates with another car in a long-term parking lot at the airport. Our fight club mechanic says he can get, he can start anything. Two wires twist out of, steer, out of the steering column. Touch the wires to each other. You complete the circuit to the starter solenoid and you get a car to joyride with. Either that or you can hack the key code through a dealership. Three space monkeys are sitting in the back seat wearing their black shirts and black pants. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I ask, so where's Tyler? The fight club mechanic guy is holding the Cadillac open chauffeur style for me. The mechanic is tall and all bones with shoulders that remind you of a telephone pole crossbar. I ask, are we going to see Tyler? Waiting for me in the middle of the front seat is a birthday cake with candles ready to be lit. I get in. We start driving. Even a week after Fight Club, you've got no problem driving inside the speed limit. Maybe you've been passing black shit, internal injuries for two days, but you are so cool. Other cars drive around you. 
car's tailgate. You get the finger from other drivers. Total strangers hate you. It's absolutely nothing personal. After Fight Club, you're so relaxed, you just cannot care. You don't even turn the radio on. Maybe your ribs snag along a hairline fracture every time you take a breath. Cars behind you blink their lights. The sun is going down, orange and gold. The mechanic is there, driving. The birthday cake is on the seat between us. It's one scary fuck to see guys like our mechanic at Fight Club. Skinny guys, they never go limp. They fight until they're burger. White guys like skeletons dipped in yellow wax with tattoos. Black men like dried meat. These guys usually hang together, the way you can picture them at Narcotics Anonymous. They never say stop. It's like they're all energy, shaking so fast they blur around the edges. These guys in recovery from something. As if the only choice they have left is how they're going to die and they want to die in a fight. They have to fight each other, these guys. Nobody else will tag them for a fight and they can't tag anybody except another twitching skeleton. All bones and rush since nobody else will register to fight them. Guys watching don't even yell when guys like our mechanic go at each other. All you hear is the fighters breathing through their teeth. Hands slapping for a hold. The whistle and impact when fists hammer and hammer on thin hollow ribs. Point blank in a clinch. You can see tendons and muscle and veins under the skin of these guys jump. Their skin shines, sweating, corded, and wet under with one light. 10, 15 minutes disappear. Their smell, their sweat, and these guys smell. It reminds you of fried chicken. 20 minutes of Fight Club will go by. Finally, one guy will go down. After a fight, two drug recovery guys will hang on to, will hang together for the rest of the night, wasted and smiling from fighting so hard. Since Fight Club, this mechanic guy is always hanging around the house on Paper Street. Wants me to hear the song he wrote. Wants me to see the birdhouse he built. The guy showed me a picture of some girl and asked me if she was pretty enough to marry. Sitting in the front seat. The guy says, did you see this cake I made for you? I made this. It's not my birthday. Some oil was getting by the rigs, the mechanic guy says, but I changed the oil in the air filter. I checked the valve lash and the timing. It's supposed to rain tonight. So I changed the blades. I ask, what's Tyler been planning? The mechanic opens the ashtray and pushes a cigarette lighter in. He says, is this a test? Are you testing us? Where's Tyler? The first rule about fight club is you don't talk about fight club, the mechanic says. And the last rule about Project Mayhem is you don't ask questions. So what can he tell me? He says, what you have to understand is your father was your model for God. Behind us, my job and my office are smaller, 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 gone. I sniff the gasoline on my hands. The mechanic says, if you're male and you're Christian and living in America, your father is a model for God. And if you never know your father, if your father bails out or dies or is never at home, what do you believe about God? This is all Tyler Durden dogma. 
scrawled on bits of paper while I was asleep and given to me to type and photocopy at work. I've read it all. Even my boss has probably read it all. What you end up doing, the mechanic says, is you spend your life searching for a father and God. What you have to consider, he says, is the possibility that God doesn't like you. Could be God hates us. This is not the worst thing that can happen. How Tyler saw it was getting God's attention for being bad was better than getting no attention at all. Maybe because God's hate is better than his indifference. If you could be either God's worst enemy or nothing, which would you choose? We are God's middle children, according to Tyler, Tyler Durden, with no special place in history and no special attention. Unless we get God's attention, we have no hope of damnation or redemption. Which is worse, hell or nothing? Only if we're caught and punished can we be saved. Burn the Louvre, the mechanic says, and wipe your ass with the Mona Lisa. This way, at least, God will know our names. The lower you fall, the higher you'll fly. The further you run, the more God wants you back. If the prodigal son had never left home, the mechanic says, the fatted calf would still be alive. It's not enough to be numbered with the grains of sand on the beach and the stars in the sky. The mechanic merges the black Cadillac onto the old bypass highway with no passing lane and already a line of trucks strings together behind us going the legal speed limit. The corniche fills up with the headlights behind us and there we are talking, reflected on the inside of the windshield, driving inside the speed limit as fast as the law allows. A law is a law, Tyler would say. Driving too fast was the same as setting a fire, was the same as planting a bomb, was the same as shooting a man. A criminal is a criminal is a criminal. Last week, we could have filled another four fight clubs, the mechanic says. Maybe Big Bob can take over running the next chapter if we find a bar. So next week, he'll go through the rules with Big Bob and give him a fight club of his own. From now on, when a leader starts fight club, when everyone is standing around the light in the center of the basement, waiting, the leader should walk around and around the outside edge of the crowd in the dark. I asked, who made up the new rules? Is it Tyler? The mechanic smiles and says, you know who makes up the rules. The new rule is nobody should be the center of Fight Club, he says. Nobody's the center of Fight Club except the two men fighting. The leader's voice will yell, walking slowly around the crowd, out in the darkness. The men in the crowd will stare at other men across the empty center of the room. This is how we'll all be at the fight clubs. Finding a bar or a garage to host a new fight club isn't tough. The first bar, the one where the original fight club still meets, they make their month's rent in just one fight club Saturday night. According to the mechanic, another new fight club rule is that fight club will always be free. It will never cost to get in. The mechanic yells out the driver's window into the oncoming traffic and the night wind pouring down inside the car. We want you, not your money. The mechanic yells out the window. As long as you're at Fight Club, you're not how much money you've got in the bank. You're not your job. You're not your family. And you're not who you tell yourself. 
the mechanic yells into the wind. You're not your name. A space monkey in the back seat picks it up. You're not your problems. The mechanic yells. You're not your problems. The space monkey shouts. You're not your age. The mechanic yells. You're not your age. Here, the mechanic swerves us into the oncoming lane, filling the car with headlights to the windshield, cool as ducking jabs. One car and then another comes at his head on, screaming its horn, and the mechanic swerves just enough to miss each one. Headlights come at us, bigger and bigger, horns screaming, and the mechanic cranes forward into the glare and noise and screams, you are not your hopes. No one takes up the yell. This time the car coming head on swerves in time to save us. Another car comes on, headlights blinking high, low, high, low, horn blaring. And the mechanic screams, you will not be saved. The mechanic doesn't swerve, but the head-on car swerves. Another car, and the mechanic screams, we are all going to die someday. This time, the oncoming car swerves, but the mechanic swerves back into its path. The car swerves and the mechanic matches it head on again. You melt and swell at that moment. For that moment, nothing matters. Look up at the stars and you're gone. Not your luggage. Nothing matters. Not your bad breath. The windows are dark outside and the horns are blaring around you. The headlights are flashing high and low and high in your face. And you will never have to go to work again. You will never have to get another haircut. Quick, the mechanic says. The car swerves again and the mechanic swerves back into its path. What, he says, what will you wish you'd done before you died? With the oncoming car screaming its horn and the mechanic so cool, he even looks away to look at me beside him in the front seat. And he says, 10 seconds to impact. Nine in eight, seven in six. My job, I say, I wish I'd quit my job. The scream goes by as the car swerves and the mechanic doesn't swerve to hit it. More lights are coming at us just ahead and the mechanic turns to the three monkeys in the back seat. Hey, space monkeys. He says, you see how the game's played? Fess up now or we're all dead. A car passes us on the right with a bumper sticker saying, I drive better when I'm drunk. The newspaper says thousands of these bumper stickers just appeared on cars one morning. Another bumper sticker says things like, make mine veal, drunk drivers against mothers, recycle all animals. Reading the newspaper, I know the misinformation committee had pulled this or the mischief committee. Sitting beside me, our clean and sober fight club mechanic tells me, yeah, the drunk bumper stickers are part of Project Mayhem. The three space monkeys are quiet in the back seat. The mischief committee is printing airline pocket cards now that show passengers fighting each other for oxygen masks while their jetliner flames down toward the rocks at a thousand miles an hour. Mischief and misinformation committees are racing each other to develop a computer virus that will make automated bank tellers sick enough to vomit storms of 10 and $20 bills. The cigarette lighter in the dash pops out hot and the mechanic tells me to light the candles on the birthday cake. 
I light the candles and the cake shimmers under the little halo of fire. What will you wish you'd done before you died? The mechanic says and swerves us into the path of a truck coming head on. The truck hits the air horn, bellowing one long blast after another as the truck's headlights like a sunrise come brighter and brighter to sparkle off the mechanic's smile. Make your wish quick, he says to the rear view mirror where the three space monkeys are sitting in the back seat. We've got five seconds to oblivion. One, he says. Two, the truck is everything in front of us, blinding bright and roaring. Three, ride a horse, comes from the back seat. Build a house, comes another voice. Get a tattoo, the mechanic says. Believe in me and you shall die forever. Too late, the truck swerves and the mechanic swerves, but the rear of our Coronacci fishtails against one end of the truck's front bumper. Not that I know this at the time. What I know is the lights, the truck headlights blink out into darkness and I'm thrown first against the passenger door and then against the birthday cake and the mechanic behind the steering wheel. The mechanic's lying crabbed on the wheel to keep it straight. And the birthday candles snuff out. In one perfect second, there's no light inside the warm black leather car and our shouts all hit the same deep note. The same low moan of the truck's air horn and we have no control, no choice no direction and no escape and we're dead. My wish right now is for me to die. I'm nothing in the world compared to Tyler. I am helpless. I am stupid and all I want and need and all I do is want and need things. My tiny life my little shit job, my Swedish furniture. I never, no, never told anyone this, but before I met Tyler, I was planning to buy a dog and name it Entourage. This is how bad your life can get. Kill me. I grab the steering wheel and crank us back into traffic. Now, prepare to evacuate soul. Now, the mechanic wrestles the wheel toward the ditch and I wrestle to fucking die. Now, the amazing miracle of death, when one second you're walking and talking and the next second you're an object, I'm nothing. And not even that, cold, invisible. I smell leather and my seatbelt feels twisted like a straight jacket around me. And when I try to sit up, I hit my head against the steering wheel. This hurts more than it should. My head is resting in the mechanic's lap. And as I look up, my eyes adjust to see the mechanic's face high over me, smiling, driving, and I can see stars outside the driver's window. My hands and face are sticky with something. Blood? Buttercream frosting. The mechanic looks down. Happy birthday. I smell smoke and remember the birthday cake. I almost broke the steering wheel with your head, he says. Just nothing else. Just the night air and the smell of smoke and the stars and the mechanic smiling and driving, my head in his lap, all of a sudden, I don't feel like I have to sit up. Where's the cake? The mechanic says, on the floor. Just the night air and the smell of smoke is heavier. Did I get my wish? 
Up above me, outlined against the stars in the window, the face smiles. Those birthday candles, he says, they're the kind that never go out. In the starlight, my eyes adjust enough to see smoke braiding up from little fires all around us in the carpet. Chapter 19. The fight club mechanic is standing on the gas, raging behind the wheel in his quiet way. And we still have something important to do tonight. One thing I'll have to learn before the end of civilization is how to look at the stars and tell where I'm going. Things are quiet as driving Cadillac through outer space. We must be off the freeway. The three guys in the back seat are passed out or asleep. You had a near life experience. The mechanic says. He takes one hand off the steering wheel and touches the long welt where my forehead bounced off the steering wheel. My forehead is swelling enough to shut both of my eyes and he runs a cold fingertip down the length of the swelling. The Cadillac hits a bump and the pain seems to bump out over my eyes like the shadow from behind the brim of a cat. Our twisted rear springs and bumper bark and creak in the quiet around our rush down night road. The mechanic says how the back bumper of the Cadillac is hanging by its ligaments. How it was torn almost free when it was caught the end of the truck's front bumper. I ask, is tonight part of his homework for Project Mayhem? part of it he says i had to make four human sacrifices and i have to pick up a load of fat fat for the soap what is tyler planning the mechanic starts talking and it's pure tyler durden I see the strongest and the smartest men who have ever lived, he says, his face outlined against the stars in the driver's window. And these men are pumping gas and waiting tables. The drop of his forehead, his brow, the slope of his nose, his eyelashes and the curve of his eyes the plastic profile of his mouth talking. These are all outlined in black against the stars. If we could put these men in training camps and finish raising them, all a gun does is focus an explosion in one direction. You have a class of young, strong men and women, and they want to give their lives to something. Advertising has these people chasing cars and clothes they don't need. Generations have been working in jobs they hate just so they can buy what they don't really need. We don't have a great war in our generation or a great depression, but we do. We have a great war of the spirit. We have a great revolution against culture. The Great Depression is our lives. We have a spiritual depression. We have to show these men and women freedom by enslaving them and show them courage by frightening them. Napoleon bragged that he could train men to sacrifice their lives for a scrap of ribbon. Imagine when we call a strike and everyone refuses to work until we redistribute the wealth of the world. Imagine hunting elk through the damp canyon forest around the ruins of Rockefeller Center. What you said about your job, the mechanic says, did you really mean it? 
Yeah, I meant it. That's why we're on the road tonight, he says. We're a hunting party and we're hunting for fat. We're going to the medical waste dump. We're going to the medical waste incinerator and there among the discarded surgical drapes and wound dressings and the 10 year old tumors and intravenous tubes and discarded needles, scary stuff, really scary stuff. Among the blood samples and amputated tidbits, we'll find more money that we can haul away in one night, even if we were driving a dump truck. We'll find enough money to load this Cadillac down to the axle stops. Fat, the mechanic says. Liposuction fat sucked out of the richest thighs in America, the richest, fattest thighs in the world. Our goal is the big red bags of liposuction fat will haul back to Paper Street and render and mix with the lye and rosemary and sell to the very people who paid to have it sucked out. At 20 bucks a bar, there are only, they are the only folks who can afford it. The richest, creamiest fat in the world, the fat of the land, he says. That makes tonight a kind of Robin Hood thing. The little wax fires sputter in the carpet. While we're there, he says, we're supposed to look for some of those hepatitis bugs too. Chapter 20. The tears were really coming now, and what and one fat stripe rolled along the barrel of a gun and down the loop around the trigger to burst flat against my index finger. Raymond Hessel closed both eyes, so I pressed the gun hard against his temple so he would always feel it pressing right there. And I was beside him. And this was his life. And he could be dead at any moment. This wasn't a cheap gun. And I wondered if salt might fuck it up. Everything had gone so easy, I wondered. I'd done everything the mechanic said to do. This was why we needed to buy a gun. This was doing my homework. We each had to bring Tyler 12 driver's licenses. This would prove we each made 12 human sacrifices. I parked tonight and I waited around the block for Raymond Hessel to finish his shift at the all night corner mark. And around midnight, he was waiting for the night owl bus when I walked up and said, hello. Raymond Hessel, Raymond didn't say anything. Probably he figured I was after his money, his minimum wage, the $14 in his wallet. Oh, Raymond Hessel, all 23 years of you, when you started crying, tears rolling down the barrel of my gun pressed to your temple. No, this wasn't about money. Not everything is about money. You didn't even say hello. You're not sad. I said, nice night, cold but clear. You didn't even say hello. I said, don't run or I'll have to shoot you in the back. I had the gun out and I was wearing a latex glove. So if the gun ever became a people's exhibit A, there'd be nothing on it except dried tears of Raymond Hessel. Caucasian, age 23, with no distinguishing marks. Then I had your attention. Your eyes were big enough that even in the streetlight, I could see they were anti-freeze green. You were jerking backward and backward a little more every time the gun touched your face, as if the barrel was too hot or too cold, until I said, don't step back. And then you let the gun touch you. But even then you rolled your head up and away from the barrel. You gave me your wallet like I asked. Your name was Raymond K. Hessel on your driver's license. You live at 1320 Southeast Benning, apartment A. That had to be a basement apartment. 
They usually give basement apartments letters instead of numbers. Raymond KKKKK Hessel. I was talking to you. Your head rolled up and away from the gun. And you said, yeah. You said, yes, you lived in a basement. You had some pictures in your wallet too. There was your mother. This was a tough one for you. You'd have to open your eyes and see the picture of mom and dad smiling and see the gun at the same time. But you did. And then your eyes closed and you started to cry. You were going to cool the amazing miracle of death. One minute you're a person, the next minute you're an object. And mom and dad would have to call old doctor whoever and get your dental records because there wouldn't be much of your face left. And mom and dad, they'd always expected so much more from you. And no, life wasn't fair. And now it was come to this. $14. This, I said, is your mom? Yeah, you were crying, sniffing, crying. You swallowed. Yeah. You had a library card. You had a video movie rental card, a social security card, $14 cash. I wanted to take the bus pass, but the mechanic said to only take the driver's license, an expired community card, college card. You used to study something. You'd work up a pretty intense cry at this point. So I pressed the gun a little harder against your cheek and you started to step back until I said, don't move or you're dead right here. Now, what did you study? Where? In college, I said, you have a student card. Oh, you don't know. Sob, swallow, sniff, stuff, biology. Listen now, you're going to die. Ray Mund, KKK Hensel. Tonight, you might die in one second or in one hour. You decide. So lie to me. Tell me the first thing off the top of your head. Make something up. I don't give a shit. I have the gun. Finally, you were listening and coming out of your little tragedy in your head. Fill in the blank. What does Ryan, Raymond Hessel want to be when he grows up? Go home. You said you just wanted to go home. Please. No shit, I said. But after that, how did you want to spend the rest of your life? If you could do anything in the world, make something up. You didn't know. Then you're dead right now, I said. I said, now turn your head. Death to commence in 10, in 9, in 8. A vet, you said. You wanted to be a vet. A veterinarian. That means animals. You have to go to school for that. It means too much school, you said. You could be in school working your ass off, Raymond Hessel, or you could be dead. You choose. I stuff your wallet into the back pocket of your jeans. So you really wanted to be an animal doctor? I took the salt water muzzle off the gun one cheek and pressed it against the other. Is that what you've always wanted to be? Dr. Raymond KKKK Hessel, a veterinarian? Yeah. No shit. No. No, you meant, yeah, no shit, yeah. Okay, I said, and I pressed the wet end of the muzzle to the tip of your chin and then the tip of your nose and everywhere I pressed the muzzle, it left a shining wet ring of your tears. So I said, go back to school. If you wake up tomorrow morning, you find a way 
to get back into school. I press the wet end of the gun on each cheek and then on your chin and then against your forehead and left the muzzle pressed there. You might as well be dead right now, I said. I have your license. I know who you are. I know where you live. I'm keeping your license. And I'm going to check on you, Mr. Raymond K. Hessel, in three months and then in six months and then in a year. And if you aren't back in school or on your way to being a veterinarian, you will be dead. You didn't say anything. Get out of here and do your little life. But remember, I'm watching you, Raymond, and I'd rather kill you than see you working a shit job just for enough money to buy cheese and watch television. Now I'm going to walk away, so don't turn around. This is what Tyler wants me to do. These are Tyler's words coming out of me. I'm Tyler's mouth. I'm Tyler's hands. Everybody in Project Mayhem is part of Tyler Durden and vice versa. Raymond K.K. Hessel, your dinner is going to taste better than any meal you've ever eaten. And tomorrow will be the most beautiful day of your entire life. Chapter 21. You wake up at Sky Harbor International. Set your watch back two hours. The shuttle takes me to downtown Phoenix and every bar I go into, there are guys with stitches around the rim of their eye socket where a good slam packed, where a good slam packed their face meat against its sharp edges. There are guys with sideways noses and these guys at the bar see me with the puckered hole in my cheek and we're an instant family. Tyler hasn't been home for a while. I do my little job, go to the airport, to another airport to look at the cars that people died in. The magic of travel, tiny life, tiny soaps, the tiny airline seats. Everywhere I travel, I ask about Tyler. In case I find him, the driver's licenses of my 12 human sacrifices are in my pocket. Every bar I walk into, every fucking bar I see beat up guys. Every bar. They throw an arm around me and want to buy me a beer. It's like I already know which bars are the are the fight club bars. I ask, have they seen a guy named Tyler Durden? It's stupid to ask if they know about fight club. The first rule is you don't talk about fight club. But... Have they seen Tyler Durden? They say, never heard of him, sir. But you might find him in Chicago, sir. It must be the hole in my cheek. Everyone calls me sir. And they we wink. You wake up at O'Hare and take the shuttle into Chicago. Set your watch ahead an hour. If you can wake up in a different place, if you can wake up in a different time, why can't you wake up as a different person? Every bar you go into, punched out guys want to buy you a beer. And no, sir, they've never met this Tyler Durden. And they wink. They've never heard of the name before, sir. I ask about Fight Club. Is there a Fight Club around here tonight? No. Sir, the second rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. The punched out guys at the bar shake their heads. Never heard of it, sir, but you might find this Fight Club of yours in Seattle, sir. You wake up at Meg's Field and call Marla to see what's happening on Paper Street. Marla says now all the space monkeys are shaving their heads. 
their electric razor gets hot and now the whole house smells like singed hair. The space monkeys are using lye to burn off their fingerprints. You wake up at SeaTac. Set your watch back two hours. The shuttle takes you to downtown Seattle. And the first bar you go into, the bartender is wearing a neck brace that tilts his head back so far, he has to look down his purple smashed eggplant of a nose to grin at you. The bar is empty and the bartender says, welcome back, sir. I've never been to this bar ever, ever before. I ask if he knows the name Tyler Durden. The bartender grins with his chin stuck out above the top of the white ne neck brace and asks, is this a test? Yeah, I say it's a test. Has he ever met Tyler Durden? <sighs> you stopped in last week, Mr. Durden, he says. Don't you remember? Tyler was here. You were here, sir. I've never been in here before tonight. If you say so, sir, the bartender says. But Thursday night, you came in to ask how soon the police were planning to shut us down. Last Thursday night, I was awake all night with insomnia, wondering why I was awake. Was I sleeping? I woke up Friday, late Friday morning, bone tired and feeling I hadn't ever closed my eyes. Yes, sir, the bartender says. Thursday night, you were standing right where you are now and you were asking me about the police crackdown and you were asking me how many guys we had to turn away from the Wednesday night fight club. The bartender twists his shoulders and braced neck to look around the empty bar and says, there's nobody that's going to hear Mr. Durden, sir. We had 27 count churn away last night. The place is always empty the night after fight club. Every bar I've walked into this week Everybody's called me, sir. Every bar I go into, the beat up fight club guys all start to look alike. How can a stranger know who I am? You have a birthmark, Mr. Durden, the bartender says. On your foot, it's shaped like the dark red Australia with New Zealand next to it. Only Marla knows this. Marla and my father, not even Tyler knows this. When I go to the beach, I sit with the foot tucked under me. The cancer I don't have is everywhere now. Everybody in Project Mayhem knows Mr. Durden. The bartender holds up his hand, the back of his hand towards me, a kiss burned into the back of his hand. My kiss? Tyler's kiss. Everybody knows about the birthmark, the bartender says. It's part of the legend. You're turning into a fucking legend, man. I call Marla from my Seattle motel room to ask if we've ever done it. You know. Long distance, Marla says. What? Slept together. What? Have I ever, you know, had sex with her? Christ. Well, well, she says, have we ever had sex? You're such a piece of shit. Have we had sex? I could kill you. Is that a yes or a no? I knew this would happen, Marla says. You're such a flake. You love me. You ignore me. You save my life. Then you cook my mother into soap. I pinch myself. 
I asked Marla how we met. <laughs> In that testicular cancer thing, Marla says, then you saved my life. I saved her life. You saved my life. Tyler saved her life. You saved my life. I stick my finger through the hole in my cheek and wiggle the finger around. This should be good enough major league pain to wake me up. Marla says, you saved my life. The Regent Hotel, I accidentally attempted suicide, remember? Oh, that night, Marla says, I said I wanted to have your abortion. We've just lost cabin pressure. I ask Marla what my name is. We're all going to die. Marla says, Tyler Durden. Your name is Tyler Butt Wipe for Brains Durden. You live at 5123 Northeast Paper Street, which is currently teeming with your little disciples shaving their heads and burning the skin off with lye. I've got to get some sleep. You've got to get your ass back here, Marley yells over the phone, before those little trolls make soap out of me. I've got to find Tyler. The scar on her hand, I asked Marla, how did she get it? You, Marla said, you kissed my hand. I've got to find Tyler. I've got to get some sleep. I've got to get to sleep. I've got to go to sleep. I tell Marla good night, and Marla's screaming is smaller and smaller, smaller, gone as I reach over and hang up the phone. We'll continue next time with chapter 22. How you guys doing? I hope it sounded good. We had a lot of dog interruptions. So next time I probably won't do like an 8 p.m. since they eat at 9. Um, I'll probably do it like after 9. You learn every time you do these things, right? Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Thank you, Batman, Steph, Zav Girl, Dark Sea, Soul for Music. Hi, thank you. I know Libra Scales was in here earlier. I hope Caitlin feels better. Anyone who's listening. Oh, hi, Sister Through 25. Thank you so much. Heavenly Clouds was in here too. Oh my goodness, you guys. Thank you so much. Remember, if you're not subbed, to sub because I can't, I want to put chapters in for people that play, that want to listen on replay. And there might be a thing where I have to have like so many subs to do that or hours trying to figure out how it works. But if you do enjoy it and you're listening and you're not subbed, just sub because I'll be reading more. If you don't like it, then don't sub. Then don't sub. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Enjoy your night. I hope you sleep well. Thanks for hanging out with me. And Batman, thank you for being here with us. You you spent a lot of time with us tonight. Thank you. I hope you have a really good rest of your night and a great weekend, you guys. Thank you so much. Good night.